four residents from the town of Dayton since our last meeting. Mrs. Loretta Gracia, Elaine Perry, Beverly Shimkus, and Manuel Oliveira. And in their memory, I ask for a moment of silence, please. Thank you. Thank you. So we're going to have a presentation uh, on the uh, municipal vulnerability preparedness plan that the town of Dighton has uh, come up with. We've had two meetings. Uh, we had a core group that met in, was it October? I know you're part of that group. Was it October? Yes. And then we met on, uh, more members met on December 4th. We have two people here that are going to be presenting the PowerPoint presentation. Uh, it's William Gunther. That's correct. Plus, Plus and O'Neill. Plus and O'Neill. And also Jamie Kaplan yep. from Consultant Inc. She works on emergency plans. So we're going to move uh, seats. I'm going to plug this in and you can uh, start your presentation. So as the presentation warms up, I uh, want to take a moment and thank uh, Town Administrator Mallory for uh, engaging us and having us work on this project and the select board uh, for having us here tonight to talk with you about uh, this program. Uh, as was mentioned, this is the Municipal Vulnerability Preparedness Program or MVP for short. So I'll be using the, the shortened version from now on. And also at the same time, uh, we're working on an MVP program and plan uh, we were also updating, uh, with Jamie's help, the hazard mitigation plan for the town of Dighton as well. And this is a listening session to really go through uh, what the process was, uh, what, the, uh, what the outcomes were uh, for both MVP and uh, hazard mitigation. So I'll give you a, a short introduction of the MVP program, uh, the ins and outs of it. Uh, I'll introduce uh, Jamie to talk quickly about uh, Dighton's hazard mitigation plan. We'll talk about uh, climate change as it relates to the town of Dighton a little bit, discuss uh, the prioritization that came out of the workshops uh, that we had for this project, uh, and then briefly mention some upcoming uh, grant opportunities, uh, and then take any questions and discussion afterwards. So quickly, the town of Dighton was awarded uh, a grant to uh, do the MVP program uh, planning process and update its hazard mitigation plan at the same time. These processes, while similar, are different, and Jamie uh, will go into some of the differences when she talks about the hazard mitigation plan. Uh, but essentially what we're doing is preparing the town and giving uh, the town through a process that is collaborative uh, across town departments and stakeholders within the town an ability to plan for the future and plan for the future with rela uh, related to uh, hazards and climate impacts. Uh, for the MVP program, we focus on three main areas, infrastructure, society, environment. Infrastructure is pretty uh, obvious. That's stormwater infrastructure, sewer infrastructure, culverts, bridges, that type of thing and how it relates to climate. Uh, society, uh, how communities deal with emergency preparation, uh, how you deal with vulnerable communities within uh, your town. Uh, and then your environment, uh, town forests, uh, natural hazards, incidents of brush fire, stuff like that. Uh, and then the HMP is similar. You have assessment, participation, and prioritization phases. So this MVP designation uh, leads to enhanced standing in the state of Massachusetts. Uh, it not only has its own grant program that's well-funded, uh, it's a multi-million dollar grant, uh, grants available annually now for the past three years, but it also uh, gives the town preference points in a number of other grant programs across the state, uh, coastal zone management grants, 
uh, small bridge program, DER culvert replacement grants like that all have uh, aspects to them that ask if you're an uh, MVP uh, community. So an overview of the planning process to, so to, in order to com complete the planning process, uh, the community had to take uh, several steps uh, mandated by the state of Massachusetts, which was developed by the Nature Conservancy, and it's this Community Resilience Building Workshop. So as was mentioned before, we met twice, once with a core team, which was mostly uh, municipal department heads. Uh, so we had DPW, highway, uh, town administrator there, water, sewer, that type of thing, and then uh, the Community Resilience Building Workshop is a broader spectrum of stakeholders across the town and it's bringing in uh, different private utility providers, uh, state DOT was at that meeting, uh, water providers in town, uh, even uh, businesses are also invited to participate in that process. And the idea behind that is to create a plan that is not just something that's cooked up in a back room by two people in a easel but it actually is representative of the community. It's representative of the stakeholders, both within uh, town government and uh, the community at large. And what you end up with is a plan that really reflects that. Uh, within the process, we identify the community's strengths and vulnerabilities, and then we I identify different responses, and I'll be talking about those specific responses a little bit later. Uh, and then we uh, work within that framework to prioritize those as action items to be sort of how the town plans on tackling uh, climate response over the next 5, 10, 20 years. Uh, and then our job as uh, your support is to prior prepare and review the, the report and the prior priorities uh, and then help the community move forward uh, into the action grant process to get you actual funding to do the projects that you've identified as necessary. Uh, I'll go through this slide very quickly. This is just a, a puff slide of our company. We've done this program uh, with, I want to say, 30 communities on the planning side, and we've helped uh, communities get uh, almost $5 million in action grant awards. And really, this is a short way of saying you're benefiting not only from our experience as professionals in the industry, but you're also benefiting from our experience and our broad range of experience across the state of Massachusetts to help bring things that have come up in other communities and bring them and help uh, Diane maybe spin them to their advantage as well. So for Fuss and O'Neill's team, I, I see that this slide's a little cramped. So Arnold Robinson, who couldn't be here tonight, uh, he's our regional planning director. Uh, he, he really directed the process for Fuss and O'Neill. Uh, myself, I'm an environmental scientist with uh, water and natural resources. Uh, I've been working on these types of projects for 10 years. I was an environmental advocate before I worked with Fuss and O'Neill. And Stefan Bengston uh, was also part of the CRB process uh, from our team, uh, bringing a lot of GIS analysis and support uh, for the town in that way. Now we'll give the floor to Jamie real quick. Okay, thank to read you. The <laughs> credentials. So, yeah, my credentials. Um, so we do have a lot of experience writing hazard mitigation plans, um, specifically in Massachusetts as well as nationwide. Uh, and as you can see, we've done a number of them in conjunction with the MVP program, which is what we're doing with you all. Um, so we did, we are currently working with Beckett, but we, um, Fairhaven's MVP is, is just about finished. We already had their workshop. Um, and I also wrote Lexington's and Pittsfield's um, with Fuss and O'Neill. So we've got a system um, pretty well in place at this point. And as I said, I have some nationwide experience. So I've written um, three plans, three mitigation plans for the territory of American Samoa. Um, I was in Maui last week working with the county of Maui. <laughs> so coming back there is not easy in the middle of the winter. <laughs> but, um, and I do work with a number of Indian tribes. Uh, most of them are in southern and um, the middle of California. And, uh, but we do do a lot of planning in New England. So I've written several plans for the Scrod, which is um, in central Connecticut. So this next slide uh, identifies. So as part of the process, we identify the top hazards that uh, the community faces. And that, these top four hazards come from the, the universe of hazards, everything from tornadoes, tsunamis, uh, 
down to sea level rise, rising temperatures. And we worked with the core team to identify uh, the four uh, climate hazards that made the most sense for Dighton. And they are intensity of weather events, so uh, both intensity of snowstorms, but intensity of precipitation events, uh, coastal riverine flooding, uh, which is fairly ubiquitous across uh, Massachusetts, rising temperature, and then sea level rise because uh, Dighton does have uh, a coastal aspect to it. So when we got to the uh, Community Resilience Building Workshop, what we did is use this ri risk matrix. The top priority hazards were filled in over here. So you have you know, extreme weather events, sea level r rise, and then we have those three categories I talked about before, infrastructure, societal, and environmental. And we worked in uh, groups of, was it 10, 10 or so? Different people in each group, uh, varying backgrounds. You know, we tried to break everybody up so each group had a broad range of experience and perspective uh, to bring to the process. And then we began filling out uh, this matrix. So we were identifying areas of strengths and weaknesses across town, uh, and then adding action items to how the community would like to address those strengths and weaknesses moving forward, and then ultimately ending up with a prioritization of high, medium, and low uh, at the end of the process. And this just gives you an idea of, of how that uh, process worked collaboratively. You can see in the, in the photograph on the left, you have you know, people working around the table. We have you know, our, our team working really as scribes to really just write down your thoughts and, and what you think is important to your community and help consolidate that information. We have the maps that you see on the right where people were physically marking uh, strengths and weaknesses on the map, whether it be uh, hazardous waste sites, uh, brownfield sites, uh, areas where there's known flooding, stuff like that, that we could then take to help work through the prioritization proce process. Uh, so now that we've gone through the process, we identify uh, the climate change impacts, identify your strengths and weaknesses, give them a prioritization, and then our job is to pull all that together into one uh, compendium product uh, to deliver to the state and really be your roadmap for the future. And I'm going to blow through these three slides because I know they're not very readable, so I can get to the actual high, medium, and low priorities. But this is what the risk matrix looks like when it's all filled out. So once we did all the handwritten risk matrix matrices. Uh, we memorialized those, brought them back, and then took all that information and, and put that into these matrices, which are in the report, which will be available online for people to read. And that was infrastructure, here's society, uh, and here's environmental. But to give you something that's actually digestible that we can actually read and go through, uh, the high priority actions that came out, culverts and bridges were a theme across both of the major groups and something that uh, people were very concerned about across town uh, from flooding, uh, access, evacuation for a number of different reasons. Uh, addressing flooding specifically on Route uh, 138, uh, conduct dam assessments across town, both publicly and privately owned dams, uh, undertake comprehensive infrastructure repairs on Lincoln Avenue, uh, conduct feasibility studies for redesign and relocation of municipality, municipal buildings located within the floodplain. Uh, develop uh, evacuation plans and routes uh, for different populations across town. And it's important to know now that we're going through the high uh, priority actions, by ranking these as high priorities, these are all the actions that uh, the way they're written up is intended to make them fundable under the action grant program. So this is what the community is actually looking to do in the short term is to address these through the action grant process. More high priority actions, uh, conduct strategic planning to support regi regional agriculture in the face of climate change. Uh, as climate uh, impacts affect your agricultural community, they're gonna have longer growing seasons, but they're also gonna have challenges with precipitation, both the intensity of that precipitation and the duration of it. Uh, increase tree health and address tree mortality uh, as climate changes, you're going to also see your forest structure change. So the town thought that this was something important to memorialize and, and keep track of since there is quite a bit of forest in Dighton. Uh, formulate a comprehensive area plan for neighborhoods and infrastructure located along Route 138. 
on the shoreline of the Taunton River for low-lying communities. Obviously, this has uh, specific impacts uh, to deal with uh, sea level rise uh, is an important part of this one. Uh, create uh, an inventory of all existing sites with environmental pollution for flooding risk and potential contaminants. You know, where are uh, these sites that have known contamination and are they at risk of mobilizing that contamination during uh, either sea level rise or these uh, high precipitation and flood, flood events? Uh, assess the viability of the hurricane barrier along the Taunton River and increase the resilience and preparedness of Lincoln Village housing a vulnerable community uh, in the town. Continued high priority actions, uh, develop and comprehensive uh, strategy to increase emergency shelter capacity. Uh, we see this one in a lot of communities where uh, shelters, you know, as we have these uh, higher impact storm events, shelters are gonna be uh, more important, not just for what I think people traditionally look at as the you know, winter events causing the need for these shelters, but also the need for these shelters in the summer if there's brownouts and stuff like that. Uh, develop transportation planning for vulnerable populations during hazard events. Uh, this was talked about uh, by both groups quite a bit. Assess cost-effective green infrastructure opportunities for stormwater management. Uh, conduct robust education and outreach to build awareness of town resources. And this is across the board, whether it's for shelters, warming or cooling centers, uh, just generally in getting information out to town during emergency events. Uh, continue education and outreach to residents living in flood prone, flood prone areas, making them aware of evacuation routes as they're developed, making them aware of uh, how to shelter in place properly and give them uh, more information on uh, preparedness actions that they can take at home. Uh, develop educational resources and building code recommendations to support programs for residents interested in storm hardening and increased flood resiliency. More high priority actions. Uh, evaluate opportunities to provide improvements, uh, critical facilities, especially emergency backup power, and this is across town. So for emergency services, backup power for schools, for backup power uh, shelters, uh, it's critically important to have those backup power uh, needs addressed. Increase public awareness programs uh, related to vector-borne diseases as you know we saw in the last year with Triple E across Massachusetts that unfortunately is probably the new normal where we're going to see a lot of these vector-borne diseases creep further north and how we educate the town and make sure our response is appropriate so that was definitely a good one. Develop comprehensive tree and forest management program we touched on that a little bit earlier. Uh, study the segregated river hydrologic system and make sure uh, we're addressing any uh, flooding issues along the segregated and relating them back to uh, anticipated increases in precipitation. Engage the community in uh, exploration of stormwater management approaches for the Three Mile River watershed, uh, a watershed with uh, impairments, uh, water quality impairments and uh, seek to establish resilient natural infrastructure. You know, nature, nature based solutions is uh, key to this program and is key to accessing a lot of this funding. It's good to have this as part of it, but it's also good to remember that nature based solutions are the most cost effective. Uh, they're the easiest to implement, they cost the least amount. Uh, nature is better at doing this than we are in a lot of, in a lot of instances. And then we'll go through some of the moderate priority actions to give uh, a little depth to where the discussion went and, and all the universe of things that have ended up on the plan. Uh, protect and enhance coastal marsh habitat through adaptation and migration projects. Uh, sea level rises, these marshes are going to be migrating inland. Uh, so it's good to you know, take that into account. These marshes are actually, in a lot of ways, your flood barriers on the tidal, tidal zone. Uh, prepare a plan with a with emergency plans and best management practices to support agriculture, agricultural irrigation in case of extreme drought. Uh, you know, how does the town with such a rich agricultural history balance the need uh, for water for residents and water for agriculture? I think that's particularly important and definitely good that it made it into the plan. Uh, study the entire Segregancy River watershed area to develop uh, mitigation plans for threat of increased flooding events. Uh, Plan for access to gasoline supply during emergencies, since there are not that many gas stations in and around town. Uh, complete study of sewer line expansion on Route 138. 
additional moderate priority actions, complete zoning bylaw revisions for solar farm developments as those become more prevalent, uh, raise access road and construct new dock at town boat ramp off Pleasant Street, pursue opportunities to fund open space acquisition uh, that will mitigate the effects of increased storm events. So areas uh, where you can actually acquire property, uh, where you can install green infrastructure, where just acquiring the property will uh, enhance flood protection, uh, and then develop an alternative emergency staffing plan. And then some of the lower priority actions, uh, study the potential impact of sea level rise and extreme weather events on Dighton Power Facilities and the desalination facility. Uh, study and address erosion taking place on the Segregancet River west of Route 44 and coordinate with DOT on their upcoming project. Uh, collaborate with the town and state agencies to address erosion more frequent flooding at the Bristol Aggie School. Uh, review existing plans to understand impact of extreme weather and temperature rise on the existing propane storage area on Cedar Street and plan for the long-term adaptation of lane field into a salt marsh and removal of man-made infrastructure. With that, I'll pass it along to Jamie to talk about your hazard mitigation process. Okay, so simultaneously to the MVP program, we're writing this hazard mitigation plan. And uh, just like with the MVP, we're looking at a real laundry list of hazards. And we're doing it because when we think about mitigating risk, it's a really good way to save money. Um, and it's been, this is just some numbers from uh, the most recent study uh, about how much you can in fact save. And you know, it's like insurance, you, you're paying ahead. Um, but if you pay to retrofit something as opposed to rebuild it, it will cost less. Um, and when we think about mitigation, which is not something that people use that word a lot, um, we're really thinking about any kind of action you can take prior to the hazard. Okay? We, don't, we don't want things to become a disaster, but we can't stop heavy rains, we can't stop an earthquake, we're not stopping sea level rise. These things will happen, but we can make sure that your stormwater management system, your road system can handle it. We can make sure that you have a prepared population to handle it. So that's what you're thinking about when you're mitigating risk. And the plan that we write takes, um, is an update to the SERPED plan, that Southeastern Regional Planning and Economic Development District mitigation plan from so long ago. Um, Dighton was a part of that in 2004. Um, so we read that carefully and make sure we bring forward what was in there. And that's a requirement with FEMA. Um, we also need to be compliant and consistent with the state hazard mitigation plan. I had a uh, lead role with uh, developing that's the Massachusetts state plan and uh, it serves us well because it combines climate adaptation with hazard mitigation. So the Massachusetts state plan is unique in that way. Most state plans aren't doing that. They're, trying to move the country in that direction, but not everywhere is as progressive as we are. Um, so we are consistent with that, and obviously we're being consistent with the MVP program as well. All of that comes together, you'll have your own hazard mitigation plan. Putting that plan together, um, the graphic shows you sort of our planning process, if you will. Um, we organize to develop the plan, if you, um, we assess your risks and capabilities, um, develop a mitigation strategy, and then you need to adopt and implement the plan. The key thing with that is that you are involved in the whole process, and that's a requirement that FEMA has. Fortunately, with the MVP program, like the core team meetings that you have for MVP, you're having them for mitigation. That's why I keep coming to these meetings as well. There's no point in having another meeting. Um, because the topic is nearly identical. Uh, so we do have the core team meetings. We will probably have one more core team meeting that's just about the hazard mitigation plan. Uh, the CRB workshop, obviously that content is fueling the mitigation plan. Um, stakeholder interviews, so I've talked to some of you. I sent some emails to some of you today. Um, we'll have public meetings or listening sessions. We'll have one more listening session. Uh, towards the end of the plan. The survey that um, we have, if you haven't taken it, go for it. I encourage you. And then everybody that has a chance to re uh, review the draft plan. So um, as a core team, as the public, the plan will be made available for everybody. 
So the core team, most, uh, many of you are obviously on the core team. I apologize, this graphic is not your core team. Um, but the core team is providing, supporting data and information, um, assisting in identifying hazards as well as mitigation actions. Obviously, you'll review the plan. And then finally, um, the plan will need to be adopted by the town. So just a few um, preliminary survey results that we have, because the survey's been live. We have only 47 surveys received to date. We'd like to double that. Um, so if you haven't taken it, I encourage you again to do so. Um, but with the survey, it's a, it's a good chance to get the public to participate a little more in these processes of, of MVP and hazard mitigation. And I think the information that comes out of the survey is valuable to writing these plans, but it's also valuable to the town moving forward. It's good for you all um, as leaders in the community to have a sense of, for instance, preparedness. Do people have carbon monoxide detectors and smoke detectors in their phone? Yes. Do they have a household plan or a disaster kit? Not so many. Um, how do they like to receive information is a question we ask in the survey. What have they done? Um, for instance, if they've purchased generators, that's something that you need to know. How many people do have generators and are they using them safely? And, uh, that's something that could lead to how you educate them as well as to how much you need to open a shelter, right? So I think the information is, is good for both projects and, and for you moving forward. So when we think about risk, which is what we're trying to do, um, we take a little bit more of a detailed look than the MVP process. And we think about natural hazards. And again, we think of as many as we possibly can. Um, we look at previous occurrences, what has happened in Dayton and in the region in the past, um, where has this occurred, right? So you won't have flooding equally throughout the town. Um, and we think about, well, what's the future probability? How likely are these events to occur in the future and um, what will they look like in the future? And then we want to combine that with, well, what is Dayton? What's the community? What's here? Who are the people here? Um, what are their needs? Um, for instance, you've got elderly people, you may have some disabled people, young people, you, you know, you're gonna have some preschools, that kind of thing you need to keep in mind. What is your built environment? Um, and that's looking at your um, buildings such as this one, as well as infrastructure. Um, we think about the natural environment and the economy. What is your economy relying upon? Um, and for you, obviously, the, there's not huge industry right here. You have some, but you also have a lot of people traveling your roads, your infrastructure to go to work. So it's something that you want to think. And we combine these to come up with risk. When we think about the hazards, I mentioned previously that we look to the state plan. So because the state plan combined climate adaptation with hazard mitigation, we have these climate change interactions. That's what's on the left side of the screen. And for your plan, we're gonna be consistent with that. So the list on the right are all the natural hazards, but we'll organize them by climate change interactions. So when you write a hazard mitigation plan, you always consider climate change in the sense of how it's impacting these hazards. Um, and we don't consider it a hazard in and of itself. Um, I should pause and say, do you have questions about this list? Okay. So we also look at critical facilities. Obviously, some of you participated in that. Um, I know the, the pictures are never the most flattering. <laughs> My apologies. <laughs> so we do want to have a really thorough list of what are the facilities, whether it's infrastructure um, or buildings that you're relying upon. And we consider that so that we can think about, well, what's going to be the risk and the impact if these facilities, whether it's roads, bridges, buildings, um, do have a problem. So obviously, you can see here. So we've got some localized flooding. So then we think about mitigation actions. And the mitigation actions is really the key part of the whole process. It's the what are you going to do about all this risk that you've identified. And the MVP process goes through talking about your strengths and your weaknesses. Um, and then you come up with your ideas, the high, medium, and low priorities. 
so the mitigation actions are going to stem from those ideas. We're going to use those that you already developed to come up with what we would call mitigation actions. So you will, you'll have two separate plans, but a lot of that content is going to be very similar. And it's really important to me that we emphasize what your high priorities are, that that comes clearly through this. So, um, and I think you already have these types of projects, but when we think of hazard mitigation, usually anything that we could think of in terms of what would be an action or a project would fit into one of these categories. So local plans and regulations, that's gonna be things like your zoning bylaws and that, um, or any kind of town report or um, plan that you put together. Um, not expensive to write these plans usually, but politically charged, right? If you change your building codes or something or require a higher standard, then that's a little tricky. Your structure and infrastructure projects, these are things like rebuilding the bridge or fixing a culvert. They're high budget. Um, and they're the projects that usually come to mind pretty quickly, right? We know, why, you know, we need this or this building's inadequate or, you know, whatever. Um, the natural systems protection, just like Bill mentioned, really good to prioritize because those systems are mitigating your risk, especially to flooding. And similar to the MVP, grant funding that you'll receive um, by having a hazard mitigation plan, the um, environmentally friendly projects, if you will, will get prioritized um, in terms of giving you grant funding. And then education and awareness programs. And those tend to be a really big bang for your buck. Um, you know, if you can do some, some education through the school systems um, or in a senior center or any kind of group, if you have a more prepared and educated community, if they're aware of their risks, if they're aware of how the town functions in a disaster, that's going to really lessen the amount of response that you need to have. Um, you can also educate them about how they can mitigate risk at their own homes, right? Where to safely clear trees and branches, where not to dig, right? We're always talking about dig safely here. Um, that kind of thing goes a long way. I am going to skip the next slide. So your high priority actions, as um, Bill mentioned, really kind of run the gamut. And uh, they're very good. They're things that we commonly see. I think that they fit into these categories. You know, we're talking about, um, as Bill said, bridges and culverts, tree mortality, um, conducting different assessments, looking at your emergency shelter capacity. So the MVP is gonna give you a pretty, uh, pretty long list. What we're gonna do with the hazard mitigation plan is hopefully take that list and see if we can make it a little more concise and develop those actions a little bit further. So you have some very specific actions and I just pulled out a few for this slide and these were some of your more high priority ones. With the mitigation plan, we wanna make sure that each action gives a time frame for when you would hope to implement it and that time frame has to be between one and five years. So the, the MVP projects look way beyond the five-year scope, whereas with the mitigation plan, it's fine to have projects in your plan that go beyond five years, but the ones that you're, um, the majority has to be within five years. That's what FEMA is requiring. So we would pull them out and put them in a different space to kind of meet their, their need. Um, so we do time frame. We'll look at cost and we'll do a cost benefit um, review. Not a full cost benefit analysis that if you've applied for grant funding through the state and FEMA, you've probably gone down that rabbit hole of cost benefit analysis. Um, but we will do some cost benefit review. We're gonna um, make sure that each of your actions has a lead um, department or agency attached to it, as well as identify some partners to be involved with it. So the projects will not be shovel ready, but they're gonna be headed in that direction so that you could sort through a list and say, okay, here are the projects that we're gonna to look to our roads people, or here are the projects we want the fire chief to focus on, you know, that kind of thing. Um, we do develop what we call mitigation action tracker, which is an Excel spreadsheet, or it could be a Google sheet, whatever works for you. But it's basically we list all of these projects and all of that detail, and then we build in some forms for you towards maintaining your plan. So it's going to be simpler 
for Mallory to reach out on a quarterly basis. Okay, where are we with these projects? Great. Um, these are the next ones to focus on. So you know you don't have to implement any of these projects, whether it's MVP or mitigation, um, in the order that they're listed. So if you decide to go for funding for a low priority project and implement that, so what? Totally okay. You know, and normally what gets implemented is someone gets the drive to apply for funding and implement a project. Um, it could be like a pet project or, um, you know, or you might find a funding source where you think, yeah, this project fits in um, perfectly for that. So, so finally what we're going to do is um, obviously write, finish writing the plan. Um, you'll have an opportunity to review the plan. Once the um, plan is sort of goes through uh, the public review and the core team review, it will go to MEMA at the state. Um, they take time to review the plan. When they like it, Massachusetts Emergency Management Agency, when they're happy with it, they send it directly to FEMA. FEMA can take a month to three months to look at it. This whole review process kind of drags on a little bit. Um, so, in all honesty, um, when FEMA is happy with the plan, um, they'll send uh, Mallory a letter that says the plan is approved pending adoption. It's that time that the town needs to adopt the plan. Officially, you have a year to actually adopt the plan. I encourage you to just do it as directly as you can, um, and then you're eligible for these funding sources. With um, with the adoption, I should say that it, the plans remain living documents, so it's possible to continue updating, continue changing the plan. It will be written into the plan that if you have a disaster, you review the plan because your priorities and the projects that you have may shift, and it will be simpler for you to get funding if what you're looking for is already in the plan. Um, and just an example I could tell you, I told you in the beginning I worked with some um, Indian tribes. There's a tribe that lives uh, in a mountain on, um, in San Diego County. And wildfire was their hugest risk. It was so dry there, and they're, you know, the whole plan was written to mitigate wildfire. But they ended up having large fires. And then their priorities shifted because now they were prone to landslides. There was nothing holding that hill anymore. So it makes sense to look at the plan and make sure that you're, you know, you're focused on what's priority. So finally, and the plan's good for five years, so you get to do this again in about four, four and a half years. <laughs> um, so the benefits of the process is that you're going to come up with some cost effective actions that reduce risk. They are all your ideas. You know, Bill and I, I, I will chip in some, some thoughts, I'll go through your list, and if I think things are missing, certainly add them, but the majority of the ideas are really coming from your community. You, you know, I feel like I work all across the country and know exactly the questions to ask you, but I don't live in Dighton. I don't drive these roads. You know, you know when you wake up in the morning and it's like, oh, it's gonna freeze. I know, you know, this bend is gonna be too icy for me or whatever. So you wanna make sure that's included. Um, the focus is obviously your greatest vulnerabilities. I think the planning process really does build partnerships. Um, it's probably uh, a good excuse, if you will, for all of you to get together on a semi-regular basis and kind of focus on this. Um, it will communicate your priorities, and that's a priority of mine and ours, that the plan really reflect what you want to do. So if there's a project that you know you want to do, we're going to make sure that that's at the top of your list. Um, and the project, the plan will align with all the town objectives. So we've gone through a lot of um, town contents, your website, the other plans that you have in place just to make sure that it is consistent with that. So that's all I have. And if you have any questions, happy to ask them. I think our next slide is actually questions. We didn't inspire questions. Not, not, even, not even one question. Not even one question. All right, well, thank you. Thank you. I can think of one. Did you find anything, since you've done a number of these plans yeah. and in different parts of the country, did you find anything in Dighton that was sort of unique? For MVP, for me, your <coughs> agricultural heritage, not only the agriculture community that's in town, but also the, the school. 
I think w was one of the unique outcomes from an MVP perspective. Um, and one that I, th I thought was really, really cool to be able to, to work with you guys on. Uh, the one to five year uh, deadline? Yeah. Do they take into consideration in that deadline the fact that you have to apply for a grant and then it takes a while to get like the funding to actually start the project? Is that all taken into consideration or is it a firm-ish deadline? So that's a really good question. It's not the most realistic. Um, so for all the projects as a group, we'll decide you know, within that time frame when we think we want to implement the project. You're not held to it at all. We just don't want to extend beyond five years, and it doesn't look very good if you say everything will be in five years. So we just spread it out, but it's none of it accounts, it, it can account for how long it takes to apply for funding and get it, but that's something that we would do. It's not something that on a state or federal level, they're sort of, they're not adding time. Or an addendum it's too. It's, it's, it's in conjunction. So the master plan is from 2014 right now, so mm -hmm. you need an update anyway. Right. This sort of propels you forward and kind of, we're on a very, um, with a lot of Slug and Goulart's work with stormwater management and what um, Superintendent Ferry is doing, we're actively kind of carving out all of these projects anyway. Uh, Slug and Goulart made a very key point that I just wanted to reiterate that some of this is actually being done already. It sounds scary when you put it all on one list, like we have millions and billions of dollars of work to do, but some of it's already being implemented. And so you would use this as kind of a jumping off point to add to what your master plan would be. So all these plans that we're all working on, culvert management, everything sort of goes together as addendums, but you would reference these for sure. And some of the action items I think it's important to know too are not high dollar amount action items. Right. Developing evacuation routes you know with your emergency services in town is not something that's going to cost hundreds of thousands of dollars but it's critical to how the community deals with uh, hazards moving forward right so it's important that not everything is like this huge mountainous project uh, that's going to cost the town lots of money there's a lot of little things that are that are in here memorialized in here so that that if the town does want to seek funding for them they can um, but a lot of them don't require that kind of uh, monetary commitment. And the state likes it if you go for some small budget ones because they have a certain amount of money and then you know, good point. they're going to give out what they can and then they're going to be left. Like, you know, if you give a kid, you know, 20 bucks or $10 and then they're like, no, I have three. But, you know, there is a project, a low budget project, so you might as well go for that too. It's fine. Or combining action items like right. education now outreach programs with uh, developing evacuation routes, just as an example, right? Those two would go hand in hand. They're listed as two individual priority actions uh, that the community wants to, wants to work on, um, but that stuff can be added and subtracted to when you're talking about accessing funding. For the mitigation plan, we'll add those. We'll, we'll lump them together because yeah. in five years when you update your mitigation plan, you need to account for all of your actions so let's not have too many, right? Let's have a manageable list of you know 25 actions or something, and that's that's enough. You don't need to have hundreds of them. And like the hazard mitigation plan, the, the MVP program is something that's supposed to be a living document. And as things change, as the town's priorities change, uh, it's you know the, the community has the ability to alter this plan through the core team and through you know the state has forms. Uh, it's a quick meeting and, and you can reprioritize these plans to make sure that the projects as they come up can can seek funding into the future. It's, it's an excellent program, uh, and an excellent way for the community to sort of adapt. You know, the, the idea behind it is for you to look at, look at your strength, strengths and weaknesses now, but also give you the flexibility so that you can adapt as climate forces you to adapt.
gives us a well-rounded approach to mitigation and to addressing what we face. I mean, as a coastal community, we, we found that a lot of our municipal buildings are in a category one flood zone, which is a little horrifying to me. Um, do you feel that this plan is, is well-rounded enough to carry us through? Like, are we on a good track of? Definitely, and a lot of this stuff got brought up at the Community Resilience Building Workshop, right? It's just what has come out in terms of prioritization sort of ends up being flooding focused based on uh, the needs of the town. But all, all this stuff, you know, looking at the intensity of precipitation, but also the lack of precipitation, you know, increased days over 90 degrees was discussed. You know, we're looking at, uh, got a slide, got extra slides, just in case you want to get really in the weeds. Um, average temperature, increased days over 90 degrees, you know, we're already talking up to two weeks by the 2030s, you know, 10 years from now. That's kind of scary, right? Up to two weeks more of 90 degrees. That was discussed during the CRB process. You know, how does, how does that affect the agricultural community, right? We talked about, about that a little bit. How does that affect uh, schools? How are kids supposed to be taking exams uh, when it's 90 degrees outside and schools don't have air conditioning, right? That's stuff that the town has to deal with. It may not have risen to the highest priority based on the prioritization, but it was definitely comprehensively looked at. And I should add, though, Mallory, that the list for the mitigation plan isn't set yet. So we just have the list for the MVP, and right. what we'll do is combine those and start working with them as a core team. Thank you. Are there any other questions? If not, thank you. Thanks. Thank you so much. season and as you know we meet the second and fourth Wednesday of the month we're going to be meeting uh, more frequently so we're going to meet next week at seven o'clock and we will begin the budget process so we'll have departments come in and we'll be discussing their budgets and be making a recommendation that will be going to the Finance Committee the town of Dighton food bank distribution will be held next uh, on February 15th this is coming Saturday 2020 located in the town hall lower level uh, that's at eight o'clock Tom here. Yeah. The Memorial Day Parade Planning Open Meeting is set for February 27th at 7 p.m. in the Old Town Hall upper level. Uh, there will be uh, early voting for the presidential primary, which will begin on February 24th, 2020 through 2027. It'll be downstairs in the uh, basement. Uh, to be eligible to vote on the March 3rd presidential primary, you must be a registered voter or make ne any necessary changes to your voter registration by February 12th. So if you haven't done it by now, it's uh, too late. In Dighton, early voting can be done in person at town, uh, Dighton Town Hall, lower level, 979 Somerset Avenue. Uh, during the following dates and times, February 24th, 730 to 430, 25th, 26th, and 27th, 730 to 430. And obviously the uh, primary, uh, presidential primary is March 3rd and it's from seven o'clock in the morning to eight o'clock at night. All registered voters have the option to request an early voting ballot through
through the mail, simply fill out the application or mail to the town of Dighton, clerk's office, 979 Somerset Avenue, Dighton, Mass. You can find the application on the Secretary of the Commonwealth's website, www.sec.state.ma.us slash ELE. Please note, however, once a, a voter has cast an early voting ballot, the voter may no longer vote at the polls on election day. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to contact. This is Sue Madiris at 508-669-5411, option number two. And just to remind everybody, there is a town-wide parking ban is still in effect uh, until April 1st. I know we haven't had any real snow, but we still have the parking ban. No person shall allow any vehicle to remain, to remain in the streets so as to obstruct snow removal. Police will take notice. Public input. There's a few people here. Any public input? Anybody have any concerns? Nope. Uh, town Administrator's report. Uh, just in consideration of our time, I uh, only put on one item for my report. Just to let you know that we did indeed receive the draft sewer study from our engineers. I had sent it over to the sewer commission. They reviewed it. I bring this up because uh, last meeting you had asked about it. So um, I just wanted to update the board and the public that we did receive the draft. The sewer commission reviewed it. I will be meeting with um, Mr. Ferry, who is the liaison, I, I guess, uh, for lack of a better term. Uh, on that project with me and we will be meeting with the engineers to go over that once we do you'll have an updated um, report the public will have an updated study to look at and discuss and that's all I have tonight Very good. old business actually this is, is this new business it it's was tabled business, but it's the, first. Yep, the first reading of the committee appointments policy so we're coming up surprise surprise we're coming up with another policy uh, the background of the town of Dighton has various boards and committees that perform specific functions of government and are often governed by state or federal law. The Board of Selectmen shall make appointments of town officers who are sworn to faithfully perform the duties prescribed by law and must be routinely be accountable for their actions. Purpose and applicability. The town of Dighton boards, committees, and commissions must be educated in state and local requirements related to their duties. Therefore, when making appointments, the board must promptly vet and examine the qualification of those with positions on boards, committees, and commissions, and to educate them on the laws under which they are operating. These practices will ensure that the town maintain the highest quality of service for the benefits of the residents. This policy shall not apply to compensated posted employment positions. For regulations concerning those positions, please refer to the hiring policy. Policy, the selectmen shall appoint the following boards, committees, and commissions. ADA Coordinator, Agents of the Board of Health, Agricultural Commission, American with Disabilities Act Commission, Board of Health, Board of Registrars, Crystal County Advisory Board, Burial Agent, Bylaw Review Committee, Cable Television Committee, Cannabis Policy Advisory Board, Capital Outlay Committee, Cemetery Commission, Community Preservation Commission, Conservation Commission, Constables, Council on Aging, Cultural Council, Development and Industrial Committee, Trails Committee, Dighton Water, District Water Resource Trust Board of Trustees, the Dighton Rehoboth Regional Agreement Task Force, Dighton Rehoboth Finance Advisory Committee, Dighton Rehoboth Regional District School Study Committee, Electrical Inspector, Emergency Management Director, Emergency Preparedness Committee, Fence Viewers, we still have Fence Viewers? Absolutely. <laughs> Field Drivers, Film Liaisons, Forest Master, 40B Committee, Gatra Advisory Board, Representative, Graves Officer. That's not the same as the burial agent, I guess? No. no. Mm -mm. What is the difference? Uh, one process is the actual death certificates, and those, that's um, Mrs. Madeira. No, no, the Graves and Officer is uh, Mr. Uh, Reddy, correct? Graves. He puts the flags Graves. out. Right, and the burial agent does the yeah. administrative. The Greater Attleboro Town Home Consortium, Representative, Green Committee, Grant Committee, Harbor Master Historical Commission. Uh, I see a repeat of some of these. Mm -hmm. uh, Finance Authority, Inspector of Animals, Inspector of Plumbing and Gas, Insurance Advisory Committee, IT Committee, Committee. You Joint missed, Trans you missed uh, Harbor Master. Those were the two. You just missed two. I thought I meant Harbor Master Historical Commission here. Oh, it's that repeated, was there too. repeated okay. twice. Joint Transportation Planning Board Representative, Serpid. Land Use Committee, Li Liaison to Ethics Commission, Municipal Coordinator, Right to Know, 
Municipal Hearing Officer, Open Space Committee, Parking Clerk, Test Control Superintendent, Police Station Building Committee, Police Review Board, Public Records Access Officer, Sealer of Weights and Measures, Soil Conservation Com Commission, <coughs> Special Police Officers, Serpid Representative, Stormwater Committee, Tax Possession Custodian, Taxation Aid Committee, TIF Review Board, Tobacco Control Agent, Town Council, Town Historian, Town Nurse, and Zoning Board of Appeals. Two, interested candidates for boards, committees, and commissions shall fill out a volunteer information form either on paper or electronically on the Town of Dighton website. Their information will be passed to the respective board committee commissions that they are seeking to join. That board committee commission shall meet with the candidate and issue a recommendation for appointment to the Board of Selectmen after majority vote of the current members of the board committee commission. The Board of Selectmen shall vote at a meeting to make the final appointment in accordance with the recommendations upon being appointed. The new member shall be sworn in by the town clerk and collect, collected paperwork at the town clerk office, including open meeting law and conflict of interest law do documentation. All committee members must complete the state mandated ethics and conflict of interest test and must submit a copy of their completion certificate, which shall be kept on file at the town clerk's office. All appointees to the committee subject to the appointment by the Board of Selectmen shall be registered voters of the town unless their non-residency is disclosed prior to appointment. Five, regu regular committee members of statutory or bylaw created committees serve for the term of the years prescribed by the statute of, is that should be or bylaw, statute of bylaw? Or, statutory. If a term is not prescribed by a statute or bylaw, there shall be one year in length. Term, terms expired on June 30th of each year. Members appointed to fill an unexpired term shall have the same expiration date as the person he or she is replacing. The Board of Selectmen may appoint ad hoc advisory committee to aid on matters under the Board of Jurisdiction in an effort to gather expertise to prepare the members for an informed decision. Charges to advisory committee shall be in writing and will include the work to be undertaken, the time in which it is to be accomplished, and the procedure for reporting to the Selectmen. Ad hoc committees must report in writing at least annually to the selectmen. Ad hoc committees shall be dissolved upon the completion of their work. Eight, resignation must be addressed to the town clerk who shall notify the Board of Selectmen. Nine, per Article 16 of the Town of Dighton's General Bylaws, committee members must attend at least 60% of, of that committee's regular meetings in any six month period. Valid medical, military, or circumstances beyond a member's control subject to be to the appointing authority review shall not count towards absences. Failure to attain the 60% attendance record may result in removal from the committee at the discretion of the Board of Selectmen. 10, committee members must be sworn at the town clerk's office to take action at the respective meetings. Failure, failure to do so will result in votes being null and void. <coughs> Does the board have any questions regarding this? I don't have any questions. I think it's a good policy. I guess my, uh, suggestion would be i'm not sure every board is aware every committee commission is aware that they need to take a vote on a recommendation to send to the board prior to us uh appointing someone so i don't know if we i assume we have everyone's contact information is there a way we can just send all the chair people an email and just let them know that this is the the procedure going forward sure and it's a little different for committees that we're just forming, like the ADA Commission, because we don't have enough members so far, so they won't be voting on any recommendations for any members, I assume. Mm -hmm. Right, well, you have to set them up. Yes. Any other questions? Yeah, on uh, number five, where we get regular committee members of statutory or bylaw created committees, we need to put, and the DR Financial Advisory Committee, because that's neither a statutory oh. or a bylaw, uh, but a it's regional a regional agreement. agreement, the one we just, you know, we just have the meeting. Yeah, so, the so it would be after committees and the DR Financial Advisory Committee. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? I am just going to change the Bristol County, Advo um, Bristol County Advo Advisory Board representative, correct? It's not the whole board. Correct, yeah. So I have to add that yes. in there. And then I'll double check the duplicates there, um, review that entire list. Anything else? I think we should put representative for the uh, the task force, the agreement, because we only appoint two people to that. Mm -hmm. Representatives, thank you. Is that it? Mm -hmm. New business. Uh, we
received a uh, letter that was sent to the, uh, Mr. Aguiar, the Building Commission, uh, from the Dighton Historical Commission. I want to note to the public that I am a member of the Dighton Historical Commission. Dear Mr. Aguiar, the members of the Dighton Historical Commission has, have reviewed the building permit application for the Dighton Board of Selectmen for the demolition of 949 Somerset Avenue, Dighton. We have determined that the building at 949 Somerset Avenue, Dighton, meets the criteria of the significant building as defined in a demolition delay by law. It is more than 100 years old and is associated with an historic person in town. We'll be holding a public hearing to determine if the building at 949 Somerset Avenue, Dighton, shall be preferably preserved. The public hearing will be held on Tuesday, February 11, 2020, at 7 p.m. in the Selectman's Meeting Room at Dighton Town Hall, 979 Somerset Avenue, Dighton, Mass. Since this building is considered a significant building through Dighton history, we, we respect fully request that a top on the roof be replaced. And this is from the chairman of the Dighton Historical Commission, Patricia Gales. And we did meet last night and we determined after a public hearing that it is a uh, preferably preserved building. And uh, Mr. Aguiar, the commissioner who was present at the meeting, uh, will be uh, notified in writing of that. So what's before us is uh, whether or not we want to uh, put a top on the building. It's the position of the Historic Commission since we've asked for a delay and it's going to take six months that we are going to try to find someone to either take the building or the whole building or parts of the building and we think because there's mold in there that by not having a top on the building uh, it's going to create more mold. As you can uh, see the top is falling apart and uh, we feel it needs to be replaced. So what is the board's feeling on that? I don't think a top, top is going to improve anything simply because there's no heat in the building. With or without a top, the mold is going to take over. Uh, the moisture's there. We're going to have the heat and humidity of the summer. And quite frankly, we'll be getting into the summer in the six months, uh, which is going to add a, a plastic. I assume the top is going to be plastic. That's even worse. You know yourself, you put something, wrap it in plastic. It doesn't breathe. The other thing, too, is possibly the heat of the summer when we don't get the stifling humidity, might do something to slow up mold spread. But my concern is let's not prevent evaporation, I guess is the best description I'm thinking of. That would be my only thought. Like I say, I haven't been in the building a few times already that the top that we had in the past has prevented more water damage from happening. And uh, there is mold there, whether it dies in the winter or not, I'm not sure. but. Uh, I don't think there's much evaporation coming from the roof. The idea is to keep moisture from coming through the roof. So uh, I think a top should be placed on the, there is a, a rough estimate of, I believe, is it uh, roughly $1,200 that we think it may cost to purchase the top as well as uh, install it on the roof, roughly. And do we have funds, do we have uh, funds available that we account for? We have the public buildings account, but they go to everything, so. Is the top, the blue plastic that's up there now, or is that like a patch you put on a roof that you're gonna replace? That was a top. That that's was the, a top? That's deteriorated over time from the UV sprays and the weather. Okay, because I'm thinking of the tops we used to cover wood in the backyard. We've had them for years. We take them off in the, but in the winter we put them on. They're much heavier, and they've never done that. Uh, stripped and, that, that looks like thin plastic to me. As opposed to the it's, plastic it's, ones we've got. It's weaved, right? Yeah. There's, there's different grades of tarps, so I'm okay. sure that one was the lowest grade possible. Okay. Um, so I'm not, if this board was inclined to move forward, I'm not planning on buying the best tarp on the market because we only have six months. We have six months. And then the fate of the building will be decided. How long did we have that? That wasn't our tarp. I'm sorry, let me back up. The tarp that's currently on it was from the previous owners? I believe it was from the bank when the bank okay. took possession of the property. My concern is just that the, the, the tarp is expensive and it looks like, I remember that tarp didn't look like that when it first went on there. Um, and it looks like it deteriorated quickly. Is this a tarp, if you purchased it, that we could reuse for something else? It depends on the weather that it's sustained while it was up there. Um, to put it on there properly, we would have to put uh, wood strips over the tarp so that the wind wouldn't take it off. So we would penetrate the tarp so it would lose its ability to shed water properly. So to reuse it, if you used it to 
shed water, then the answer would be no. So I think for argument's sake, the top would be a single-use product. So it would leak. Well, it, it would it would leak, but less than it's leaking right now without any protection. But the answer to your question is yes, it would it would potentially leak. You need to you need to put uh, wood two bys on top of it to stop the wind from making it act as a sail and then tearing it off. Right. So, right. You could put a ceiling where you put the holes, right? Where you, we we could. Where you put like the farrowing or whatever you're putting on it. As long as the budget would allow, that's what we would do. The ceiling's not that expensive. Does the and I apologize, I was not at uh, last evening's meeting. Does the commission have someone that's interested in the property, which is why they want to preserve the roof in hopes that um, we have some people interested in the uh, purchasing parts of the building, possibly. Uh, we had uh, the, the committee uh, had a meeting last week. At, I believe uh, Mrs. Gula was there also last week at the house, and we had some people that were interested. It's got white, you know, boards for the floor and stuff like that. So there is there is interest in the in the uh, building, but it would have to go out for a bid. Uh, but you know, if we thought nobody had any interest, we wouldn't ask for a six month delay. But we've asked for a six month delay because we think we can in some way preserve it. Whether someone's gonna take the whole building and move it, that's probably not gonna happen. At town meeting, the statement was made if the people voted to buy it and then they voted to demolish it, the clock started. Why are we talking six months now? Because it's when the uh, Star Commission gets the uh, application for the demolition. It's when it happens. So the, they so may have voted for it in October. We, the Star Commission did not get it. There was not an application until about October. Yeah. So. so I said that to the last known person uh, who was the chairman uh, of the commission, that letter did not, uh, was not picked up. It was not received by the commission. I, it wasn't until I reached out to the administrative assistant that there was a new chairperson that was recently appointed by the commission, at which time I made sure we hand-delivered a letter to that individual. So it was it was issued it was. for the back, but they yes. didn't get it. Okay. So I just have a point of clarification on the bylaw. I was under the impression that it was the application, the permit application to demolish filed with you started the six-month delay. It's that's, filed with the historical commission. not go uh, in my favor, it was the commission who said it was from last night's meeting. How was it done I prior? Don't, I, don't, I wasn't I there. The first so. time there was a six month delay that's been acted on by the commission. There's never been a six so month So we delay. haven't had to. Right. Okay. I understand. That sounds like a separate issue. I think yeah. we, <laughs> I'm, um, I mean, we've owned this house. We should talk about the TARP, yeah. yeah. I would just, if we're gonna spend $1,200 on a tarp, I would hope that we could reuse it, would be my only, would be my only wish. I, I don't think it's realistic that we're gonna be able to, uh, to use it. The, they're coated by color, if I'm correct, on tops. So blue is like one of the cheapest, you know, it's the real estate agent, whoever put it up there, they're not gonna spend a lot of money on it. They were trying to sell the building, get rid of it. So that's one of the, the cheaper ones. And if you, if you go on the property, there's all fragments from that top all over the place, and it's, that's going to have to be cleaned up. But we're talking about a six-month period to try and uh, preserve the building so someone may have an interest in at least parts of the building anyway. I guess my concern would be spending the money for the tarp, and then the building. there's no interest in the building gets demolished, I guess. We, we have no guarantee. You know, if you want me to tell you that we have somebody that's going to mm -hmm. take it, that's one thing, but we have no guarantee. That's the reason why we asked for a six month delay, so we have an opportunity mm -hmm. to, to reach out to different uh, people to see whether or not they're willing to uh, take the building. It's an historic building, it was built in 1750. It's one of our oldest uh, buildings in town. It's gonna be uh, torn down. Uh, that's the wishes of the town, I get that, but if the historic commission would like to see if someone will take either the parts of the building or the whole building. And it's possible that the selling stuff from the building is gonna be able to recoup some of the monies that we would use to demolish the building. So. Would it make sense to put plastic on the second floor floors 
just lay it there to protect the first floor. Because when we did, we were there a week ago, the, the two men I saw checking out things that measuring and like they had interest in acquiring, they were looking at the wide boards on the first floor. And I'm just thinking if we put, if you could just put down plastic on the second floor to prevent water from going into the first floor, which seems to be the area of interest, you wouldn't have to deal with, I would think, the wind blowing it away. You wouldn't have to use a high quality. You just, I realize it would catch the moisture coming through the roof, but there's already mold up there. We're not going to stop that mold with more plastic. Just a thought, because we're not going to treat the mold either. Exactly what I was thinking of when we had the storm. We actually put plastic on the floor of what's down the meeting room to prevent damage to the remodeling that was going on down below, and that actually worked effectively. It wouldn't cost as much as top, and we wouldn't have anybody on the roof, and we wouldn't have to. Uh, like you say, we're not going to prevent leaks. We're not going to prevent any of that. I think protecting. At least the areas I saw people measuring and talking about and hardware and that, that kind of stuff was on the first floor. Um, I, think it, I think that's worth trying to uh, protect. But um, the mold's going to keep going, um, unfortunately. Is that going to be, I know you just heard this idea for the first time, so did I. Would that be a more cost-effective temporary solution for the six months than a TARP? Maybe $150, $200. Do you remember that storm when, the, when we had the storm and we went in, they had the, the frame with the water mm -hmm. and they caught all that water to protect downstairs? So you don't put frames or you just put plastic? Or when I say frame, about? it was no, a... I, I know, but it, can it go up to it to catch the water? So in other words, you can put plastic yeah. down, the water's going to run off the plastic. Right. No, so the, the, water, the, the plastic would be turned up the wall yeah. and, and attached to the wall. So. Yeah, we wouldn't just throw plastic on the floor, so it would be turned up, yes. So what is the wish of the board? I'm okay with that, with the uh, Selectman Gulak's... Uh, I'll make a motion that we uh, authorize uh, the installation of plastic, I'll call it sheeting, on the second floor of 949 Somerset Avenue to prevent water from going into the first floor. Second. Discussion. Are we talking six mil, four mil? <laughs> what are we talking about? We don't want <laughs> well, something that's going to deteriorate, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it would be the heavy duty plastic. I believe the best I can buy at the home center is six mil. Yes. Is that what you had next door? Yes. Pretty much? Yes. Okay. Because that did work. It did. I know, Mr. Chairman, you can't speak for the entire commission, no. but is your sense that they would be happy with this? No. no. My sense is they would not be happy. Because we're talking about preserving the building. So you've got rafters, you've got this, the uh, second floor mm -hmm. floorboards, which are not as good as the first floor, but you're going to could possibly lose those. So. But they're going to they, have plastic on them. The, the other thing, too, um, what happened next door, the floor upstairs had not been finished yet. You had worked downstairs and you actually had, I think, ceilings in and things. Correct. So they put this plastic down. Came off. But when they took it up, the original floor was, was protected. It, it, the water stayed inside this plastic. And that was an emergency situation, right? I mean, the roof yeah, started leaking. And I went there in the storm and we did it at night, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Any further discussion? If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, abstention. I'm going to abstain because I'm a member of the committee. It passes. Next uh, item on the new business is to review the uh, schedule for the annual town meeting. Uh, there's a suggestion that we uh, open the warrant on February 12th, which is tonight. That we close the uh, warrant on April 8th. That on April 22nd, the Board of Selectmen vote on articles to be included on the warrant. On April 23rd through May 7th, We'll get a legal review. May 13th, we'll sign the warrant. May 18th, we'll post the warrant. And May 27th, the Board of Selectmen recommendations on warrant articles. And 
Should we also put the date of the town meeting, town meeting? Uh, which is missing June from 1st. this list? I apologize. It's June 1st. Well, on this schedule, it would be for June 1st. Yep. Uh, that is the date that we tentatively selected when we issued our meeting calendar. I'll entertain a motion. Mr. Chairman, I make a motion that we uh, approve the annual town meeting uh, schedule for 2020 as prepared uh, with the Step eight annual town meeting, June 1st, 2020 added. Second. Second. Any discussion? If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, abstention, the ayes have it. Review and discuss the Agricultural Commission's uh, vote to establish a community garden. So the Board of Selectmen received a letter uh, at our January 28th, 2020 meeting. The Agricultural Commission voted unanimously to establish a community garden at 949 Somerset Avenue, Dighton Mass, 02715. Contingent upon approval by the Board of Selectmen. The garden will be maintained by members of the Titan community and the Agricultural Commission will provide broad oversight. The purpose of the garden will be to provide fresh, healthy produce only for Titan residents who are in need of food assistance via the monthly Titan Lions, Lions Club Food Bank. We hope that you see the merits in this worthy project. Thank you for your consideration. Respectfully submitted, Agricultural Commission, Leslie Blanchett, Kenna Russo, John Buffington, Stacy Ferry, and Barbara Cadavia uh, as other members. So I know that you're part of the commission mm -hmm. as a, a liaison person for the uh, Board of Selectmen. Uh, can you uh, give us a little bit more information on this, please? Yeah, sure. Uh, so I am a non-voting member of the AGCOM, so I actually did not vote uh, on this. Uh, but the idea was, and I know it says Dighton residents in there, I believe Berkeley residents also use um, the food bank, if, if that's correct. Um, we have, we're trying to promote uh, agriculture in town. Um, we are gonna launch an educational program next year. And so our thought was, um, I know we do get a lot of produce donations to the food bank. Um, they also get a lot of canned donations as well. Uh, so we thought we would bring in different community stakeholders um, like the Girl Scouts, Boy Scouts, uh, different residents um, to have a small community garden that's maintained by the community, uh, overseen by the Agricultural Commission, so sort of, uh, you know, experts. Um, and uh, we will uh, re give the rewards in the forms of produce to um, needy families in town who need it. So that, that was the idea behind that. And if I missed anything, <laughs> Mrs. Ferry can add anything. But I did reach out to, uh, as you know, the elementary school has started a greenhouse. Um, and so this would be directly in line with what they're doing. Um, and so they were really excited when I reached out to them. And I received uh, interest from the Girl Scouts. Uh, Mr. Jonathan Gray, who I think we uh, all know, uh, helped us do the Right to Farm mm -hmm. uh, community, also is um, involved in sustainable agriculture. And I actually have interest from both the Eagle Scouts and the Boy Scouts uh, as well. And several residents uh, have reached out to not only volunteer, but um, various donations for things like seeds, um, crop seeds, and things like that. Do we, know, do we know where it's going to be at 949? I think... Sounds, because we're mm -hmm. talking about the building now, so we... Correct, yeah. I think we were going to do it uh, in the back so that n no matter what happens on the property, it'll be sort of contained. If it needed to be moved, you know, years mm -hmm. in the future, that we could do that as well. Um, initially, my idea was to uh, have the community garden be at Council Oak, but after discussing the issue with the Agricultural Commission, it came to my attention, because I was completely unaware, that water would be a problem. Uh, water access would be an issue. Um, so <laughs> thank God for experts, right? Uh, so that's when the idea was, oh, maybe we could do it in the back at 949. I believe there's some fencing over there. Um, I could be wrong, but um, I think it would be a nice spot. And I think also it would be nice, while there's nothing really going on on the property, to have some sort of community visibility by having uh, this operation in the back. So is the plan to have it done this year? I think Start we, it this year? That is the I've plan in the my spring. Seat. You probably started your seeds already at home. <laughs> well, that is, the, <laughs> that is the plan. Um, but I think the idea is it would start smaller, you know, this year especially since we're just getting up and running, um, and then add it in. Uh, as we go along, as things get moving, so. It also kind of depends on um, 
what type of seeds we get, how much we get, um, different donations and things like that. So, I, I support it, but I uh, would want it to be organic. I wouldn't want any pesticides or any chemicals used on town property. Uh, and I would hope that it, the plan would be that we'd be going organically. Yeah, I don't think, uh, so I, I apologize, we didn't actually discuss that specific uh, item. We can bring that back to the Agricultural Commission. I think that's a good point. I don't foresee them having an issue, but I can't, um, especially as a non-voting member, speak for anyone on the commission, but I don't foresee that being an issue, especially uh, when we have stakeholders like uh, Mr. Gray is helping and he's big on sustainability, so. Mrs. Gulak, do you have any questions? Um, I noticed that Leslie Blanchett is on this, so is there gonna be involvement with the Aggie School? We're gonna reach out to them. Because I'm thinking you have to have soil testing. <laughs> yeah. Nobody's grown anything over there but grass for a while. We're gonna reach out to them as well. She has said that her FFA officer, because she was mm -hmm. an FFA, had talked about doing a community garden, so they would be excited to partner with us to be able to do that. It, and none of that, if they're gonna do some testing in that, we may find out that, like with Council Oak 2, which I realized that was fodder that was being grown, the first year you let it rest, so it might be that the first year you dig it up and put down some rye and test the soil, and then the next year you're able to plant vegetables or whatever. Mm -hmm. So what would the board like to do? I actually have a suggestion, if this is okay. Um, I was hoping to see more of a, like a proposal that would include who would be involved with it, fencing for little creatures that wander out of the woods, um, and then more of a program proposal type so that we would have like an action plan to go to if people wanted to sign up, something, mm -hmm. some sort of literature that we could hand over. Is it possible to get that from the Agricultural Commission and then you would proceed? And maybe Ms. Blanchett's ruling about whether or not the soil is good and if it needs to wait a year can go in conjunction with that so that we would know how to proceed. I feel like there's so just a we, few unknowns. We didn't want to put the cart before the horse. Yeah. And remember, this is a community garden. We're, right. not, we're not building Rome uh, over there at 949 Somerset Avenue. Um, but we really wanted to get the Board of Selectmen, that's why it says contingent upon their approval, because I don't think we wanted to come across as looking as if yeah, they'll definitely buy in and be okay with it. We didn't really want to, you know, speak to anyone. Sure. But to your point, definitely that would that is what makes sense. And um, I think if it gets approved, we meet this um, month at the end of the month, and I think we can we can do that and we can submit something like that to the board for sure. Yeah. Mr. Yeah. Chairman, I'm going to make a motion that we authorize the uh, Agricultural Commission to move ahead and gather the information that was requested tonight and report back to us following the next meeting with a plan on how this will be done, how it will be managed, uh, incorporate soil testing and whatever groups we can think of, specifically like the uh, elementary students, their, their greenhouse Aggie mm -hmm. volunteers, whatever. Sure. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. So is there a second? Is that, that was the motion, right? Yes. I'll second. second. Yep. Any further discussion? If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, abstention, the ayes have it. We have received a letter from our building commissioner, uh, via selectman. Please allow this letter to serve as an endorsement to appoint James Stein as the assistant plumbing and gas inspector for the town building department. The position has remained open since our last appointment period. Mr. Stein has years of experience working in the municipal service environment and has the availability to conduct inspections during normal business hours. Please consider appointing Mr. Stein retroactively starting February 5th, 2020. Would you like to um, add anything to this? Sure. Um, yeah, our assistant position has been unfilled since the last appointment period. Our previous assistant plumbing inspector had some changes in his work environment and could no longer service the town. Um, I apologize for the delay. I had other things going on. Didn't have a need for an assistant. We had uh, the primary out with an extended illness that has moved over to over a week now. So um, I quickly took it upon myself to find a suitable replacement. I'm familiar with Mr. Sign, who works in another municipality that I'm affiliated with. I can best describe him, although we cannot ever replace the late Donald French, but I would describe Mr. Sign as a similar uh, individual. So I think he'll serve the town well. Thank you. I have a question. Why are we going retroactive to February 
Because of the oh, illness, I had to have them do inspections right away. Uh, we were delaying the projects because they weren't being inspected. So we've had some concerns in the past that people have been hired before we've actually been located. So I'm not sure what the board's position on this was. Well, I think just next time maybe um, we could make it known to people to do like an executive order for the chairperson. So at least it's um, it's not yeah Approved. retroactive and in that way. But we don't have we don't really have anything in place for that. Right. So, but we've also discussed that uh, we don't want to have too many of those executive orders. Right. We wanted a policy yeah. on that. So, I, I realize that I take full responsibility for not being more proactive and filling the spot. But um, I also have a responsibility to the contractors and homeowners, and uh, I, I needed to act and get things inspected. So, my apologies. Yeah. You don't have to apologize. I'll entertain a motion. Mr. Chairman, I make a motion that we appoint Mr. James Sign as the Assistant Plumbing and Gas Inspector, a retroactive back to February 5th, 2020. Second. Any further discussion? If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, abstention, the ayes have it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This letter is addressed to, uh, the next item is addressed to Tom Ferry. Please accept this letter as a notice of my resignation as the foreman of the highway department. My last day of employment will be February 7, 2020. I received an offer from a company and after careful consideration, I realized that this opportunity is too much for me to decline. I've, it has been a pleasure working on the highway department for the past 13 years. I have been fortunate enough to work with a great crew and supervisor, all that I consider to be friends as well. I want to conclude this letter with saying I have truly enjoyed my opportunity to work for the town, I have been lucky to have had this experience with work with and for wonderful people. Uh, sincerely, uh, Dennis Hazel. I had an opportunity last week to see him just before he uh, left, and uh, I wish him the best for, you know, as the chairman of the Board of Selectmen that uh, in the future with this new uh, endeavor. He has asked to, and we wish him luck, uh, he has asked that uh, his accumulated sick time be donated to whom it may concern, please consider the donation of accumulated sick time to create a sick bank, sick time bank slash or specifically Joe Simone for as he is facing surgery later this year and will need some help on recovery time because of this of his seniority. And he has approximately, well actually he has 571 hours and, and a quarter hours of sick time to donate. What is the pleasure of the board? Uh, I'm going to make a motion. We accept the resignation of Dennis Hazel, Highway Department Foreman, with thanks and appreciation for his years of service. Second. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, abstention, the ayes have it. What do you want to do regarding the uh, donation of the sick time? If I don't have a problem putting it into a sick time bank, um, is it wise to designate it for one person? We've done that previously in specific... We yeah, I um, that. We my only thought is if somebody else in that... Right. Well, I'll just limit it to that department for now. In that department has a medical emergency and doesn't have sufficient time. That's my only thought. So usually a sick bank is created by the unions collectively. Um, the fire department had a sick bank and then they can each voluntarily that donate into it. Yeah. So I think a discussion might be worth having a town-wide sick bank, um, but that, that has a whole slew of questions with it. Um, so at this point, I think it's better to discuss it as a donation to one person. But if you'd want to explore a sick bank, I can certainly do the research on how other communities do that if they separate um, it by union or we had one at the, at the state level, mm -hmm. at the university, and it was just... There. Exactly, and if once you exhausted your own sick leave and had to go to the bank, um, there was a, I'll call it like a, a board or Boy. somebody, mm -hmm. and you just permitted, you permitted, you had a doctor's explanation of, you know, how much longer you're gonna be out sick, and without, you know, um, getting into privacy issues, but, and then they would award it in blocks. Mm -hmm. um, would it be appropriate to set up the sick leave bank 
in the highway department um, with and have a priority list. And right now there's only one person on the priority list. All I'm saying is if, if another highway person before this individual actually has the need, has an emergency and doesn't have sick leave, I'm just thinking of across the board treating people Everybody fairly. Doesn't. That's my only thought, you know. But certainly this, this gentleman is first on the list. It, that's all I'm saying, you know. I know that uh, when I worked for the state and we had a sick, uh, sick bank also, we would have to donate some of our sick time to be part of that sick bank. In other words, if I didn't donate sick time on that, an annual basis, I could not okay. lay the goal for the sick right. bank. It started that way at the university, but and, and, and the other thing was we, you had to donate at least to join a day. Mm -hmm. uh, but the university also offered disability insurance, which mm -hmm. was at the expense of the employee. Mm -hmm. Once the university offered the sick leave bank, people dropped that insurance as fast as it could be because the older you got, the higher the premiums got. And by the time you retired, if you wanted to carry over, you couldn't afford it anyhow. So one of the things that they did at the university, and it was union, it was everybody. All of a sudden, the sick leave bank became open. And there was so much time in it that we didn't have to keep contributing yeah. days. So that's what happened. Um, and they just set up the procedure to actually access it. Uh, I think this until we, uh, up in a second, uh, Mr. Ferry, until we actually uh, set up a sick bank for the highway department or other departments, this is a specific request, a donation of the sick time. So I, I'm kind of inclined to uh, go along with this right now. But Mr. Ferry? You didn't know how to work that. I don't think at some point do we lose, does he lose these hours? I mean, what happens? Well, is, right is now where they're up in the air, we're going to instruct um, Ms. McCarran to just kind of hold them in abeyance until we figure out what we're going to do, do with them. So if yeah. you so choose if to do that. we don't have to do that, they just go away and no one benefits. Well, if, you, I, if you depart, you you, um, you, lose you your sacrifice your sickness. Yes, but I think, I think because this is a specific request, mm -hmm. and um, I mean, it's really quite a gesture to do this. Uh, so, um, Mr. Chairman, I'm going to make a motion that we take under advisement the request of Mr. Hazel that his accumulated sick leave be placed in a sick time bank uh, for the time being, which means it'll just be suspended, it'll be there until we figure out what to do or how to manage this. I'm not going to second that motion. I'll step down and second it. Uh, any discussion? I know you were, you were about to ask a question I, on the motion. I mean, the, I think what this letter says is he's asking to donate his time to a specific person. So I was willing to honor the request. We've done it in the past. So that's why I'm not going to vote to take it under advisement. Any further discussion? If not, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Nay. No. Staying. It did not pass. I'll entertain another motion. Mr. Chairman, I make a motion to permit uh, Mr. Hazel to donate 571 and 25 hours, 0.25 hours, uh, to Mr. Joe Simao. Simo. I second for discussion for. Discussion There's been a second discussion. My thought is, I just remembered this. A number of employees each donated time so that Mr. Hazel could be um, off following the tragic loss in his family. And that's another reason why I support holding this in abeyance right now because um, so many people stepped up and contributed. That's why, that's my only thought. Um, if another person um, is in dire straits and needs some help, in the meantime, if, if the other, the named person, medical situation comes up first, it's there for him. That's why I'm naming him first. That's my only thought. Any further 
discussion? If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstention? Abstain. The ayes have it. The next agenda item is the appointed highway foreman. As you may know, we have a vacancy for our foreman position. Please consider William Mendoza for our next foreman. William is our most senior employee that has been put in for the foreman position. William is at also a longtime Dighton resident, for which helps in the event that I am not available, he may be more accessible and ready to act in my place as needed. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I make a motion uh, to appoint Mr. William Mendoza uh, to the role of foreman. Second. Second. Mr. Ferry, you have any comment about this? Or? Nope. nope. <laughs> any discussion? Jeez. <laughs> That's what that sounds like. Any discussion? If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstention? The ayes have it. To whom it may concern, this is also from uh, Tom Ferry, Superintendent of Streets. Please consider RS Rental Equipment Company, quote, for one 40-foot used boom lift, parentheses, $18,000. This unit is the lowest cost for similar hours. We have seen the machine and is, it is in good working order. This piece of equipment will be an asset for all the different tasks that we perform at this time, such as building repairs and maintenance of our town Buildings, please contact me with any questions, uh, Mr. Ferry. And Mr. Ferry happens to be here, so if we have any questions, we can uh, contact him here. So we've got uh, an invoice from RS Rental uh, telling us that's going to cost that would cost eighteen thousand dollars would be the total charge, and we have a uh, picture of it. Uh, it's a telescopic boom. Uh, it has a five hundred seven pound platform capacity, standard four wheel drive, fourteen inch ground clearance. Does the board have any questions regarding this? Or have any questions uh, for Mr. Ferry? Mr. Ferry, is this the item that you had on the uh, town meeting warrant that was referred to as a man lift that we said needed to have a different title? Yes. And now it's a personnel lift. <laughs> I make a motion. How duplicitous. <laughs> Just so we're clear on that, Mr. Ferry. I, I don't find the humor in that, but okay. Um, <laughs> Mr. Chairman, uh, I make a motion that we um, award the, the bid to provide a 40-foot used boom lift to Iris Rental Equipment Company for $18,000 as recommended by the Highway Superintendent. Is there second. a second? Any discussion? If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 Oppose, abstention, the ayes have it. Uh, the next item. Uh, good afternoon, Board of Selectmen. I have reserved the Old Town Hall on Saturday, February 15th, that's this coming Saturday of this month. I am respectfully requesting a waiver of the insurance requirement and rental fee. Thank you in advance for your consideration. Mr. Chairman, I just have one, uh, two questions. Uh, what is it being used for? What, like, what is the event? A party, a, like a family function, but it's for personal use. So per the property use mm -hmm. policy, um, anyone utilizing the building is supposed to get insurance unless they request to waive it. And they have to pay well, a fee. And for the use of the, yeah. The use of the space. And we have waived it in the past for nonprofits, but Correct. not uh, for personal reasons. So what action would the Board of Selectmen like to take on this, if any? Uh, I'll make a motion that we grant the request uh, for Ms. Ms. Costa to use the hall, Old Town Hall, Saturday, February 15th, uh, and that we waive the fee, but not the insurance requirement. Is there a second? A second. Any discussion? Yeah, the reason I say that is I believe there's a possibility she could go to a, if she has homeowner's insurance, and ask that this be covered for this one event and that the town be named as an also insured. Um, I mean, we actually do that if you use the um, Lions Pavilion, the, the insurance thing, you know, we have to, we have to come. My other thought is when we had the uh, question about uh, floor damage when it was used Waxing. and, you know, so I think we need to cover the town. But certainly waiving the fee, I think, is, is okay. 
what is the logic in waiving the fee, though, if we're going to start uh, waiving the fee? We've come up with a fee uh, for well, the use know, of that hall, and now we're considering waiving it for personal. Do, I'm trying to think. There was another town employee that had a very large family gathering there. Did we charge that person a fee? It was a baby shower. We that was didn't prior have the to policy. Us coming up with, it's prior to us coming at up that with time. policy. We didn't have the policy at that time. But what so did I, we, we do? we weren't charging a fee. Uh, maybe she, I think the conversation was something about we either pay for this cleaning or they do the cleaning. I think before the fee that we named covers the cleaning charge of our company coming in and doing the cleaning. So we're not trying to make money off of renting out the space. That's not the idea. The idea is to cover the costs of the town. And I think um, that previous person had brought in some cleaning equipment and took care of it themselves. But they were one of the first people to utilize the room if I'm remembering oh, correctly. Okay. So we, we didn't, we didn't establish have a policy. anything at the time? No. I think we were writing it. So the fee was to cover cleaning. We didn't charge a fee because the person I mean, if I'm remembering the correctly. cleaning themselves. And how could we charge a fee without establishing a fee? I'm not sure how we could have done that, right? I mean, until we came up with a fee. So, anyway, any further discussion on this? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, I oppose. Abstention, the ayes have it. The next agenda item is to discuss special municipal employee designation. This is, letter is dated from, uh, on January 24th and it's from Tom Pius, Chairman of the Dighton Board of uh, Health. Honorable Board of Selectmen, it has come to our attention that the position of the transfer station attendant and backup attendant are not on the state list of special municipal employees positions for the town of Dighton. It's now in doubt whether this position was previously designated as such and may not have been voted on by the Board of Selectmen. In order to avoid a potential violation of the Mass General Laws Chapter 268A, Conflict of Interest Law, we are requesting this, these positions be voted, re-voted, at the next Board of Selectmen's meeting to be held on February 12, 2020, to be designated as a special municipal employee. Your, prop, your prompt attention to this matter will be greatly appreciated. Uh, we were given a list of all the uh, municipal uh, special employees. This uh, list is dated September 28, 2005. I don't see that on this list here. So what is the wish of the board? I have no wish. I will entertain a motion then. Before you get there, I just looked up the designation of a, or the definition of a special municipal employee and where the person that would be taking this job holds many, many hats. I just want it stated that a special municipal employee designation cannot be granted to somebody who works more than 800 hours for the same agency. He wears a lot of hats. I'm not trying to fight anything, I'm just getting it out there that do not work <laughs> more than 800 hours in the town and you'll be fine. Do you want to comment on that? Are they paid hours? Is that what you mean? It says does not earn compensation as a municipal employee for an aggregate of more than 800 hours during the preceding 365 days. The problem for this particular individual is that the planning board could go on forever depending on what's in front of them. So oh, it's see. just a warning, don't exceed the 800 hours um, to keep the designation. Right. And just also the position, the just, I'm sorry, when the, the position, it's not you as Mr. Tim Ryan's, it's the position. So the transfer station attendant mm -hmm. position would be designated a special municipal employee. I apologize. Correct, no, I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, at the time when I was appointed back in 2009, uh, the position was voted as a uh, special municipal employee. But back at that time, they worked from location A, then went to location B, then went to the state. That's why you would have that written as 2005. Secondly, I did some math. Eight hours, eight, eight hours a week, 52 weeks a year is 416 hours. I do an average of two hours a month with, I'm sorry, I do an average of four hours a month with the planning board, which is 48 hours a year. And you can take that and reduce that in half for CPC, because my meeting, our meetings only last an hour. And we, I make that a, a, um, a motion, I'm sorry, a, a 
purpose to make it so they're only one hour per month. And then with the uh, addition of Black and Red, we meet quarterly. I'm trying to increase that so we meet monthly. So in our meetings only last them an hour. But so Mr. Reins, you're, you're not compensated as Parks and Rec or CPC. Correct. So I don't believe that counts. I don't think that should count. I don't think that should count. Okay, so then so there should be no everything's all good. We're good. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, if you're entertaining motions, yeah. I make a motion that we, uh, before I make that motion, you are the assistant transfer station attendant, correct? Okay. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I make a motion that we uh, designate the transfer station attendant and assistant uh, attendant as special municipal employees. Second. Any further discussion? If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, abstention, the ayes have it. Discuss the blocking of the horseshoe driveway. I, I've seen the the roadblocks there for the uh, horseshoe driveway. So yeah, I was well, also confused. Does uh, someone enlighten us as to why this? Mr. Ferry. The horseshoe I'll, driveway. I'll, we're, we're discussing the horseshoe driveway on yeah, right. where the Veterans I Memorial is. I didn't know you were going to speak about yeah. this, name, sir. So myself, and Mr. Hershey, we discussed about this um, several weeks back. Um, just trying to preserve, we did a lot, there's a lot of new sea right around the very point of it where Bush had to be removed, unfortunately. Uh, we're just trying to, I want to avoid putting any type of salt or any type of treatment there. Leaving it open to the public, we have to treat it and whatnot. So it's just probably one more month, we're almost in March now, and then we wouldn't have to alleviate that. Uh, I don't, I'm sorry. Problems in any inconvenience, but uh, Mr. Hershey wasn't uh, aware of any problems to protect uh, the wall memorial and uh, the aesthetics for the upcoming Memorial Day. I was just curious, not inconvenienced. <laughs> but the other thing, too, is when people park there, and I'm guilty along with everybody else, you tend to park over sort of on the grass, and if they park on both sides, everybody parks on both sides of the grass. So that's kind of, you know. Uh, detrimental to what you're trying to do. So could we just vote to have so that Mrs. Goulart doesn't park there and then <laughs> everybody else can park? No. You're not alone. No. I will take an oath not to park there. I won't move the horses either, Mr. Camera. Ferry. <laughs> <laughs> so what is the pleasure of the board? Uh, I don't see a need to take action. Yeah, I was you, have, you have to just close the road. It's technically a right of way. You need to close the road. So the public should have access. Temporarily. So give us a date when you think it's going to be safe to open it. First of May? Middle of May? April 1st? Oh, no. April 31st. If there's a 31st of March, March 31st. Yeah, there is. But I'm just thinking if it's nice for Memorial Day. Um, Wait a minute, when does the parking ban end? In April, the 1st. 1st. April 1st. April 1st. So, April 1st. Mr. Chairman, I make a motion that we uh, continue to have the Horseshoe Drive at the Veterans, Veterans Memorial closed until April the 1st. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Substantial. The ayes have it. Review and sign the warrant for the primary election to the, to either of the constables of the town of Dighton. Greetings. In the name of the Commonwealth, you are hereby required to notify and warn the inhabitants of the town of Dighton who are qualified to vote in the primaries to vote at the Dighton Elementary School for precincts 1 and 2 on Tuesday, the third day of March 2020, from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. for the following purpose, to cast their votes in the presidential primary for the candidates and political parties for the following offices presidential preference for the Commonwealth, a state committee man for the 1st Plymouth and Bristol Senatorial District, state committee woman for the 1st Plymouth and Bristol Senatorial District, and town committee for the town of Dighton. And you are directed to serve this warrant by posting attested copies thereof, one at each of the Dighton post offices, one at the main fire station, and one at the town hall, all in said Dighton, seven days at least before the time of holding said meeting. Hereof fail not and make due return of this warrant. Who does this wording? <laughs> uh, 
with your doings thereon at the time and place of said voting, given under our oath the 12th day of February 2020. So I will entertain a motion to approve this warrant. So moved. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstention? The ayes have it. Discuss the invoicing the owner of the Maple Swamp Road incident. I believe this is uh, at the request of uh, Mrs. Golak that this yes. be put on the agenda. Um, since that horrendous incident, a number of people, residents, have approached me and asked, what has the town of Dayton done? Uh, when I say town of Dayton, Board of Selectmen, what has the, what has the town done relative to uh, the individual who owned the animals? Um, well, how much did it cost? Um, is the town going to bill them, him? Uh, what action's been taken? Um, I had mentioned this shortly after the incident. Uh, there was no action taken by the board. Um, I went to the Board of Health and asked them to consider it and make a recommendation to the Board of Selectmen. It was put on the Board of Health agenda. I was not notified it was coming up at the meeting. I would, certainly would have been there because I think enough people have spoken to me, the last one that spoke to me, I was out of town in a bank. The individual came up to me, a resident of the town of Dighton, you know, the, the niceties, the brief conversations, you have a nice Christmas. Then it came out, when is the Board of Selectmen going to take action against the individual who owned the animals? How much did it cost? I said, the number I've seen is approximately $3,300. That is for extraordinary expenses. Obviously, it doesn't include the response from public safety. I said, I will take it back to the board. And that's why I asked that it be on the agenda tonight, because enough people have raised the issue. I will also tell you that uh, at the meeting I was at um, almost two weeks ago, uh, the Child Advocacy Center of Bristol County down at the Venus de Milo. Uh, the district attorney was there, and I did have a brief discussion with him. And uh, I told him that people have raised issues, and I was going to bring this to the board. Um, I also know that he told me there has been a request for public records from his office, and I will leave it at that. But I think as a board, we need to respond to the people that have raised the issue. I don't think it's unreasonable for us to attempt to recoup the money that we paid out for expenses related to taking the animals, reimbursing the town of Rehoboth for kenneling, the police details they had to keep the reporters from climbing over the fence at their kennel, uh, veterinary fees, um, the um, amount of money we paid to have the nine puppies uh, cared for in a foster home, inoculations so that the animals could be adopted out, and uh, expenses of that type, including that worthless legal opinion we got from town council on that emergency meeting that was held, that it took me three calls to the state attorney general to get that straightened out. I think this board needs to respond to the people in the town of Dighton, and I don't think it's unreasonable to ask, <clears throat> as a minimum, that that money be returned to the town. It will go into the general fund estimated receipts, but I think we need to uh, get the information from accounting and uh, prepare an accounts receivable and send it to the owner of the property. Mr. Chairman, I think I think we as a community need to move forward, so I'm going to make a motion that we table this agenda item. Is there a second? I'll step down and second that. No discussion. No discussion. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? No. Abstention? The ayes have it. Selectman's report. I attended the uh, MMA uh, conference in uh, Boston on January 24th and 25th. Uh, I attended two workshops on the 24th. The first one was marijuana, new regulations and updated best practices. They discussed the, uh, de the delivery of cannabis products. Presently, medical marijuana is delivered 
recreational use marijuana is allowable, allowable in towns that allow retail sale of marijuana. Delivery has to be prior approved and verified that it's not being delivered to minors. Delivery person will wear a body cam and can deliver to a locked box. Cannot be delivered to a dormitory or federal funded housing. Hours of delivery are from 8 a.m. until 9 p.m. So this is gonna be coming to us at some point. People are gonna be asking that uh, uh, recreational uh, marijuana be delivered to their homes. There is presently a two year social consumption pilot program in 12 communities. Dighton is not one of those. Uh, this Did will they mention where, I'm sorry, I don't mean to interrupt. Did yep. they mention where, the, are they centralized? Are they all throughout the state, I west, th east, They did mention the names I don't have in front of me, but I thought it was throughout the state. So mm -hmm. different uh, type of areas, urban, mm -hmm. suburban. Mm -hmm. They will, this will not commence until there is legislative change in state law. Social consumption establishments will allow consumers to buy and consume prepackaged, shelf-stable products, vape indoors with appropriate HVAC systems and smoke outdoors with town permission in designated areas. This is something that we as a board will be able to, to vote on whether or not we're gonna allow this in our community. The second session I attended was new perspectives on school finance and budgeting. Basically, they encouraged towns to meet with the finance committee, school committee, and school administrations in October of the, for the future of fiscal year. The town can explain to the other members that the needs that that town has to address in the coming budget year, and the school can discuss their needs. Hopefully they will uh, listen to each other. Dighton and we hope to have a regional advisory finance committee. Uh, Mrs. Goulart is a member of it. We just had a meeting a couple weeks ago, appointed by the respective board of selectmen. On January 25th, I attended the Massachusetts Selectmen's Association meeting, and I am proud to say that it was unanimously approved to change the name to the Massachusetts Select Board Association. It will still have the letters MSA as its designation. And Governor uh, Charlie Baker spoke at the, uh, about the Municipal Vulnerability Program, which Dighton is participating in. We had a whole program uh, the first hour of this meeting. And we are the only state that has taken a proactive approach to climate change and how it will impact our town future. So that's just my mini report and uh, my attendance at the uh, MMA meeting. Are there any other reports? Uh, I'm gonna request that I be allowed to um delay the MMA report from today's meeting. It was our first meeting of the year. It went on and on and on. I wanna write a, a <laughs> summary. Uh, we covered so much stuff from legislation to uh, uh, water pollution and uh, workshops that we've gotta come up with for our next uh, uh, proposed, um, actually we're working on next year's convention. Um, uh, but I just want to add to, um, I also attended that workshop on school finance. And from what I heard, everything they recommended is fine if you only have a local school committee. You're dealing with a regional school committee. It's a different mm -hmm. game altogether. Um, and also to follow up on the meeting, uh, last week, uh, Mr. Pacheco and um, Mr. Schwal, chairman of the Rehoboth School, um, Board of Selectmen uh, had a meeting and we organized the committee. Um, from Dighton, um, I was elected chairman and the members are, besides me, Ed Swartz and Robert Rendon from the Finance Committee. The uh, members from Rehoboth are George Solis, who also serves on the DR School Committee, and Sue and Mike McBride, who are finance committee reps, and Sue McBride was elected clerk. So um, I just got information today that I had requested uh, copies of the FY20 budget uh, based on the amount of money that the uh, Department of Ed, DESE, uh, determined was the total budget. So I will get a copy of that over to Rehoboth, but we now have a copy uh, for ourselves. Can I ask so, you a question about that, Selectman Goulart? So this is a, uh, these are numbers that DESI has set forth, correct? This budget that came mm -hmm. in today, that's it. That's the number that they said, that's your total budget. So what, uh, maybe I missed something. So the school committee doesn't, doesn't get to change anything? Oh no, no, no. Uh, when they fail to have a budget for the 1st of December, the Department of Ed, DESE, uh, Commissioner of Ed came in, and the number they zeroed in on was that second number that Rehoboth had proposed mm -hmm. that, that didn't get approved mm -hmm. in Rehoboth. Mm -hmm. um, so um, 
That is the budget. That is, that's less than the original amount that was proposed. When the original budget was proposed, the assessment, we approved it. Mm -hmm. They didn't approve Correct. it. Correct, yeah. They've come up with another number, which is less than the original budget. So I'm expecting to see mm -hmm. some kind of a reduction in our assessment. Mm -hmm. uh, because because they reduced their end. Uh, the Department yeah. of Ed did it for them. Yeah. So the, the uh, Commissioner of Education appointed Jay Sullivan to provide oversight. And there's going to be a meeting 23rd 20, of February. 25th. 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 The DI School Committee, uh, Department of Ed will be there. And we were invited to attend that meeting to find out uh, what the impact will be. And they, they will be involved with formulation of the FY21 budget. Mm -hmm. So the goal of our committee is, uh, first of all, we have the same powers and duty as the local finance committee as it relates to the regional school district. And we are an advisory committee. Our goal is to come up with a budget that we can all agree on and we can fund and bring to both town meetings and get them passed. Mm -hmm. Without the need of Desi. <laughs> Correct. Well, if, Hopefully. If Novel idea. If it doesn't get resolved, they're not going to go away. They'll be here for Correct. FY22. Correct. And yeah. Until, so, yeah. uh, so anyhow, I would like permission to do the uh, MMA report at the next meeting, uh, next regular meeting. I'll summarize yeah, 26, it. 26, yeah. Okay. Thank you. I have just, before we move to correspondence, uh, the Open Space Committee was reconvened. Uh, we met with Bill Napolitano from Serpid. Um, because uh, there are two new members, so I needed, we needed to be brought up to speed, and essentially, they're pretty much at the end of their work. In fact, what they, uh, what Mr. Napolitano was working on with the committee is a list of, uh, once we have the open space plan, what are the next steps? So they were, uh, there was a li two page list of like different action mm -hmm. items and different grants and projects that we would be eligible for once the open space plan um, is adopted. And, and to that point, Mr. Rines, um, this will also, it's separate from the master plan, but it's supposed to be complementary. So they went through the master plan from 2014, um, but it sounds like this will fit nicely with the um, hazard mitigation plan and the municipal vulnerability preparedness uh, plan as well. So everything is coming together, and uh, I'll keep everyone updated going forward. Very good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. There are no correspondence acknowledgments. We are pleased to inform you that Primetime has received a donation in the amount of $30. As usual, all donations are turned over to the town account and deposited in the primetime gift and donation account. Should you have any questions or need additional information, please do not hesitate to call. Mr. Chairman, I make a motion that we acknowledge the donation of $30 to primetime. Second. second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those abstention, the ayes have it. The next thing is acknowledgement of the reorganization of the planning board. Gentlemen, this April will be the end. This is from Tom Pius. This April will be the end of my five-year term of the board. After much consideration, I have decided not to seek another five-year term. Also, at the end of tonight's meeting, I am stepping down as chairman so the board can reorganize if they chose, uh, choose to do so at this time. Since there are only five meetings left to the, to the election, I felt that it would be in the best interest of the board in order to ensure a smooth transition to new chair, vice chair, and clerk. I wish you all the best in the future. Cecily Tom Pius. So, as you know, he's been very active in town. He has selected for nine years, member of the uh, planning board for five years. So, I'm sure he will be missed from this, uh, the planning board. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I make a motion that we acknowledge the reorganization of the planning board uh, with thanks and appreciation to uh, Tom Pyers' many years uh, as chairman. Second. So second. Just so, just to add to that, we did receive a, a letter of the minutes of, of that meeting advising us that. Uh, uh, Mr. Ryan is the chairman yes. now of the uh, Congratulations. The planning board. For next few, yeah. Congratulations. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, abstention, the ayes have it. Mr. Chairman, I would be remiss. Uh, we had the uh, Grand opening ceremony. We didn't even mention this under our reports. We had the grand you know, opening. I had thought of that, but I didn't write it down. So if I didn't write it <laughs> down, it's not going to happen. That's how I happen. But it just dawned on me because I have a, I have a reason. <laughs> you don't. You're, you're a little younger than you're half my age. <laughs> so, 
uh, at the grand opening ceremony of the animal shelter, which we had uh, this weekend. So congratulations to our animal control officer. Uh, thanks and appreciation to our building commissioner, the building department, our highway superintendent, and the highway department on that. And at that event, this is how my memory got jogged, uh, Senator Pacheco was there. He is our state senator. Uh, he informed me, and I did not know this, that uh, he got into the budget and it got approved through the House and signed by the governor, $10,000 uh, to Council on Aging. I think it's specifically prime time from the Commonwealth. So um, thank you, Senator Pacheco. Um, as everyone knows, he got us uh, $25,000 uh, to redo the animal shelter, which we matched with uh, taxpayer money. Uh, so we want to thank Senator Pacheco for that. And I believe he's gotten this $10,000 before for prime time as well. So yeah, this is the second year in a row. So thank you very much. Uh, we appreciate that. I know we got money for um, Lincoln Village to do work there. Really? Um, hmm. Electrical and windows? Correct. Yeah. That's awesome. So he's been helpful to the town. Absolutely. Uh, all three of us were at the open house. It was a great crowd. Thank, I want to thank Stacy for organizing that and the, uh, the animal shelters come out, came out great. I love the color of the, uh, the animal shelter. <laughs> <laughs> Had a calming effect on you? <laughs> so there was a fair amount of, uh, of people there that were offering to volunteer, do some volunteer work to, to make donations, either blankets or, or whatever. Uh, and the Daisy Troop was there also to, to hand out and they gave some blankets to uh, but it was uh, well, well attended, and uh, it was a great uh, grand opener for the, uh, the animal shelter, so. Before we move on, I know I've received many questions about donations, so Stacy, um, excuse me, Animal Control Officer Fair, do you mind telling us what is needed specifically? I do take food donations, but I usually try to do that when I know I have animals in. Right now I have a cat. Mm -hmm. Kitty litter is top on my list right now. Okay. <laughs> and cat food. But mm -hmm. um, unless I have dogs, I don't want to be inundated with dog food. Yep. I do, when I do get that problem, I do give out to the people that I know in town that struggle but have animals. I send food their way. Thank you very much. And congrats. Mm -hmm. Very good. Minutes, except for review the minutes for the regular meeting, uh, Slepin's uh, meeting on January 22nd, 2020. So moved, Mr. Chairman. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those abstention, the ayes have it. Approval of the minutes for the regular Board of Selectmen's meeting of January 8th, 2019. Uh, so moved. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those abstention, the ayes have it. Approval of the warrants. Mr. Chairman, I move that the following warrants be approved. Warrant 31A-20 in the amount of $98,764.21 payroll. 31B-20 in the amount of $23,951.32 payroll. Warrant number 31C-20 in the amount of $110,121.85. Accounts payable dated January 29th be approved. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed abstention. The ayes have it. Mr. Chairman, I move that warrant 32A-20 in the amount of $100,480.63 payroll and 32B-20 in the amount of $141,000.24 accounts payable dated February 5th be approved. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed abstention. The ayes have it. Mr. Chairman, I move that warrant number 33A-20 in the amount of $101,777.26 payroll. 33B-20 in the amount of $659,323.64. A warrant 33C-20 in the amount of $1,319.20. And hold on to your hand. I know. It's <laughs> 33D-20 in the amount of $3,162,834. That's the DR assessment. The last three being accounts payable. Be approved. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Oppose abstention. The ayes have it. That's always a killer. Yes. <laughs> no. Public input. We have a few people here. Any comments? Yes. It's been tabled. It's been tabled, so technically we can't talk about it. So 
that's how it works. It goes on a different agenda, basically. First, it's on the so table on. until it comes off the table. It, it can the come best up. way to explain. Right. Oh, okay. It can, it can come up again. I can respond to your questions, not on the record. I can tell you what people have said to me and why I brought this forward. Yeah, I I fit, I knew that side. I just wanted, I wasn't opposing the people, so I, I wanted to share if it came up. That's all. Good. Any other public input? Mr. Ryan's. Just a reminder for the residents of the upcoming Easter egg hunt will be on April 11th, starting at noon time in town hall. I know it is, unfortunately, it is the same day as election day. So it will be very busy, I'm sure, in both locations. So please, we are we are requesting volunteers. Please come and help us volunteer. Without the public's help, these events are not possible. Do you want us to do like a Facebook event for that? I believe that um, the town administrator mentioned she would reach out to our PR man to put something up. Oh, there. yeah. Mm -hmm. Could that be possible? Yes, it's just a little bit early right now. I don't want people to forget, you know, so... And the schools will be notified those too, are, right? Yes, the schools are very helpful. We have uh, flyer notices that we fill out and send to the uh, superintendent's office. They approve those and then it's distributed to the schools. So usually they're a blast email now that we go out to. Uh, usually uh, we try to have it for uh, fourth graders and under or fifth graders and under. So they'll be notified as such. And I'll also put a uh, notice on cable. What, if volunteers are interested, are they contacting you directly? Yes, if you contact me directly, it's 508-415-5907. I will put my phone number out there. It is on the internet as it is. It's on a few town sites. When you're looking at it, it's there. And uh, we would appreciate um, people to come out and help us out. It's Thank a great you. event. The kids have a blast. It'll select from Chico help us last year and his wife. and. Uh, I won't, be there, this, I won't be there this year. How many kids did you push over for candy? All of them. It was quite a turnout, though. There was a, yeah, it was. a couple of hundred kids, I think. Yeah, it was I would estimate probably 250. Oh, and we had uh, some people that are, were inquiring about um, a few years ago, we had done prizes. Corresponding, uh, corresponding prizes to the neck help. So, and what happened was that the lines got a little long because it was, it was pretty large, and people you know, complained a little bit. So, we decided that we would go with another mode. So, we're going to be laning things off in, in certain lanes where age groups are appropriate, and then it's just two and a half minutes, it's over. <laughs> <laughs> did you do it by age group last year? Did you yes, do ranges? Did. Okay, yes, with, and that was the first year yes. that you d did it work out well? It worked out well, and I'd just like to say this, um, in regards to anyone who um, needs handicap accessibility, there is the road that leads down behind the track, and you can, there is access to get on, so uh, my nephew is in a wheelchair, and he's been out on that field numerous times, he pushes himself, so he can get around, I'm sure that others can, and the access is, if you drive on the side of prime time, you'll see the um, middle building. Just stay up top, but bring your wheelchairs down. And you know, if you have to have complete access where someone's not able to get out there, then I think we could make arrangements where they would be able to drive to a certain spot close enough to access the field. So, and if anybody has any concerns, they can contact the ADA coordinator, and they, he can work out something. To, to that. Just getting back to the open house at the animal shelter. I understand it's already on YouTube. Uh, there was a video taken of the open, open house and the remarks, oh. and it's on YouTube. So uh, people can uh, take Is a look at that. Is there going to be something from our, I'll call it PR guy, sent out today? To the paper? That's what they generally do. They'll send it out to all of their Photos. networks. Mm -hmm. And it's on the Titan portal? Yes. Oh, nice. Well, okay. when I checked, I, so I get an email from it when they send mm -hmm. anything out from any of our agencies. I do too. And then I checked the Titan portal. It wasn't there yet. But yeah, I didn't get She could have just done it and then sent it over, but yeah. Mr. Price, what was over. that date again for, and the rain date? April 11th. April 11th, there is no rain date, unfortunately. Oh, okay. um, the weekend prior to that is um, April 4th, and that's um, the Arujos have their event, and we always try to work around their event and not have a uh, schedule on the same day, so hopefully the weather's going to hold out. Okay, on the 19th, that budget meeting, is that going to be at 7? Yes. yes. Okay, the 26th. Are we starting at 6 p.m.? No, yes, the selectmen. So the conservation. Selectmen's, hearing, uh, selectmen's meeting is at 7, but we have a public hearing for the soil conservation at 6 p.m. Oh, all right. Mm -hmm. And there's been a request that the uh, soil conservation meeting be videotaped, so if that's possible, we can have cable uh, videotape that, make that's it fine. public record. Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. That's possible. I don't know. I can't. I don't think we can commit them because I know several just members asking. come from. Right. Yeah, we yeah. can definitely request it for sure. And they're minutes, so they're still public, right? It's not. One person specifically asked that if it could be videotaped. So. I'm sorry. What was the date on that again? The 26th. February 26th. 26th. That's 6 p.m. 6 p.m. Okay. Anything else? Mm-hmm. Motion to adjourn. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstention. Ayes have it. Thank you, Cable.